When a hometown boy becomes an international figure, that hometown, especially if it has sense and sensitivity, the way Jamestown does, honors and broadcasts that, uh, the accomplishments of that man. And so right here in Jamestown, an historical center is evolving to pay homage to and reveal the remarkable character of Robert H. Jackson, Justice of the United States Supreme Court in the 1930s and 40s. Attorney Gregory Peterson, in practice with the firm of Phillips, Lytle, Hitchcock, Blaine, and Huber, LLP, in Jamestown, became involved in the Robert Jackson legacy while working on the 100th anniversary celebration by the Jamestown Bar Association, which paid special tribute to Justice Jackson last year. Mr. Peterson has been president of the board of directors of the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation and received their John D. Hamilton Award for furthering community spirit and enhancing the quality of life in the Chautauqua region. Mr. Peterson has many other accomplishments and honors, but he's here this afternoon principally to introduce our Robert H. Jackson Scholar. The Chautauqua Women's Club is happy to welcome to the Hall of Philosophy Mr. Gregory Peterson. Thank you, Meredith. For years I've sat on the audience where you folks currently are and wondered how daunting it must be to stand behind this lectern where so many dignitaries have delivered their addresses. Thanks to the Women's Club, uh, the late Dan Braddon and Jane Leahy, I can confirm it is so. Daunting indeed. A few housekeeping matters. I would like to thank the Fenton History Center summer program participants who were passing out a little bit earlier the Post Journal prepared article, uh, Robert Jackson, Words from His Mighty Pen. Together with a recently printed pamphlet we have on the Robert H. Jackson Center. Uh, I'd like to personally thank the Post Journal and Annette Leith and Michelle Burke for making these publications possible. Also off to my right, and please spend some time after we're done, the Fenton History Center has shared a little bit of its exhibitry, which will also become subsequently part of the Robert H. Jackson Center. And the highlights are the ones to my immediate right, which are the actual presidential designations of by, one by Franklin Roosevelt of Jackson as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, and one by President Truman appointing him as Chief Prosecutor of the Nuremberg Trials. Terrific additions. The preseason program indicated that the speaker who was to join me would be Theodore Fenstermacher, associate prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials. Three weeks ago, Mr. Fenstermacher had surgery at Johns Hopkins and is recovering fine, but sends his regrets that he's unable to join us today. Finally, a disclaimer. I must admit that I am not a Robert Jackson scholar, but merely a Robert Jackson enthusiast. I will be introducing shortly Professor John Q. Barrett, who is both. Chautauqua's theme this week is heroes and heroism. I'm here today to speak to you about several heroes. The first is Robert H. Jackson, who was a local boy who had a distinguished career on a local, national, and international level. Think about it. Robert Jackson was born in Spring Creek Township, Warren County, Pennsylvania, which is just over the state line, in, in 1892. Moved to Frewsburg, New York at age five, did postgraduate work at Jamestown High School in 1910. Never attended college. I'll repeat that. Never attended college. Completed two years of law school at Albany Law School in one. Read for the law with his mother's uncle, Frank Mott. Passed the bar exam at the earliest age possible through reading of the law at age 21 and for 21 years practiced law of the highest caliber in the city of Jamestown. In 1934, he entered public service during President Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration and became thereafter counsel to the Internal Revenue Service where he successfully prosecuted Andrew Mellon, Assistant Attorney General, Solicitor General, where Justice Louis Brandeis reportedly said that Robert Jackson should be Solicitor General for life, Attorney General, and Supreme Court Justice. His career was capped by what you saw over here and the appointment by President Truman to become Chief Prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials in 1945. 
Robert Jackson died in 1954 with funeral services held both in Washington and in Jamestown St. Luke's Church. The internment was at Maple Grove Cemetery in Frewsburg, New York. Parenthetically, the funeral service in Jamestown was attended by Governor Dewey and all eight Supreme Court justices. According to Sup Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, and I'll talk about this in a second, that was an unprecedented event, which would be unlikely to ever happen again. For probably a lot of reasons. <laughs> Robert Jackson is an extremely personal interest story and certainly one of extreme interest for us folks in Chautauqua County. We lay claim to many folks, Lucille Ball, Roger Torrey Peterson, and Robert Jackson. Uh, to us, like I said, Robert Jackson fits the definition of hero. And we're seeing this play out today. The atrocities in Rwanda and Yugoslavia have within the last 10 years caused the United Nations as, to establish ad hoc tribunals to indict and prosecute those responsible for crimes against humanity. The principles of Nuremberg, which were advanced and solidified by Robert Jackson, are being utilized today at The Hague, including the upcoming trial of Slobodan Milosevic. That's relevant and that's real, and here's a Jamestown boy who is in the middle of all that. While Jackson is indeed a hero, his deeds have, until recently, gone mostly unsung nationally as well as locally. I'm here to share a chronology of events, which is really an amazing success story which involved many local heroes. This is an unabashed, at this point, uh, plug. As late as October, there was little to commemorate this great man and the legacy he left. Many folks said something should be done to honor Robert Jackson and his ideals, but the issues were what, where, and how. In November, the creation of a Robert Jackson Center seemed like a neat idea. In December of last year, the neat idea became a reality when two benefactors, Jamestown industrialist Carl Kappa and Chautauqua's own Betty Linnae, provided the funding for the creation of the center committed to preserving the memory, values, and artifacts of Justice Robert Jackson. The actions of Betty and Carl were visionary and brave. They too are heroes. They made it happen. And Betty here, I just want to say personally, thank you very much. In January, this vision gained flight when Dr. Bratton similarly caught the spirit and, the first and he became the first executive director of the Robert Jackson Center. This was merely six weeks prior to his diagnosis of cancer. In a very short period of time, from December of 2000 through March of 2001, the Jackson Center emerged from a concept, searched for a facility, purchased a facility, incorporated, established a governing board, raised initial monies, hired Dr. Bratton, and held a symposium with the Bar Association bringing back the only biographer of Robert Jackson. This warp speed activity was a result of many heroes. I'd like to identify those who have become part of the board of the center and who are my heroes. Betty Linnae I mentioned, certainly the late Carl Kappa, Jeanette Carlson, Judge Willard Cass, Randy Sweeney, Bruce Janowski, Raleigh Kidder, and Harold Adams. But now let me pause to pay appropriate respect for Dr. Bra Dr. Bratton and his legacy at this Robert Jackson Center. You know of his work at Chautauqua. Less known is his work for the Robert Jackson Center. It all started in January when Dan and I had lunch one day, and if you may not know me, but you certainly know, knew Dan, uh, we talked baseball. That led to a discussion through the lunch period about what was going on at this proposed Robert Jackson Center. And I wondered whether he might be interested. He was very candid with me. He stated that he said he had said no to a lot of opportunities while he was winding down here at Chautauqua and was looking forward to retiring and moving to Arizona at the end of the year. Nevertheless, I prevailed upon him to stop at the site which was proposed to be purchased. The good news, he did not say no. On January 24th, Carl, Betty, Harold, and others that I've mentioned gathered at the proposed facility, talked about the vision, and many positive words were spoken. Dan was intrigued. Not only did he become interested verbally, but he committed to writing what he thought he could do for the Robert Jackson Center insofar as providing strategic plan, 
a mission statement, initial programming, and development of an organizational structure. That was the Dan of Chautauqua Institution. I could sense the juices flowing, and it flow they did. For on February, 20, February 16th, Dan went to Washington. There he met up with Justice O'Connor. And as he told me two days later, the scene was something like this. Justice O'Connor asked Dan, what are you doing? I'm retired. I know that. What are you doing? He said, well, this crazy lawyer, Greg Peterson's got me involved in this Robert Jackson project. She asked him, tell me more. He then kind of spewed off the top of his head what a vision might be of this Robert Jackson Center. She reached under her uh, desk, handed him a pad and said, here's what we're going to do for your project in Jamestown and proceeded to outline, you can just visualize Dan Bratton, president of Chautauqua Institution for 16 years, acting as a secretary for Justice O'Connor. <laughs> I love the view. Uh, immediately what happened was an invitation went out to Chief Justice William Rehnquist, who part of the synchronicity of this project is he was a confidential law clerk for Justice Jackson. An invitation has been extended and I hope to announce something pretty soon. He then she then got on the phone and called the Library of Congress and said, I wondered if you folks could make a time available this morning for Dr. Bratton regarding the Library of Congress, something I'd like to see them, you folks, get involved in Jamestown. She then got on the phone and called the Supreme Court Historical Society. This is Justice O'Connor taking her time doing this. Uh, and all of a sudden, doors open for an afternoon appointment. Long story short, after all of this happened, and Dan described it in great detail, he was a flutter. He wrote all these copious notes as to how we could take advantage of it. And he said he would attempt to follow through on all of these initiatives and devote his time for the next following March through October. I'll never forget a call I made March 5th where I got the final word that we'd been approved for the sale of this particular building to the Robert Jackson Center. Our first call was to Dan, telling him of the good news. He was exceedingly excited, not only for the project, but for the upcoming events. But then he matter-of-factly told me he'd been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and that he probably would have to wind down some of his activities. He said he was going to say no to a lot of things, but he would continue on with this Robert Jackson project. I can tell you he did so. He did so with a great deal of vigor. He spent time where we would meet, we would talk, he would write, and never far were his thoughts from the Robert Jackson Center. In fact, uh, he kept a diary from the date he uh, was diagnosed through uh, just for the family and throughout it, it was, it's been shared with me, uh, of how his excitement was of this Robert Jackson project, the upcoming project, and how he was somewhat frustrated that he couldn't see all these things to a logical conclusion. I can report in the very short time that his legacy lives on. As we are mentioning, as I mentioned, we're working with Chief Justice Rehnquist to have him speak here next year. Plans are being formalized with the Library of Congress where they have indicated that they will seriously bring up a quarterly rotating exhibit to Jamestown of some of the 75,000 items they have of Robert Jackson, which is terrific. And the Supreme Court Historical Society has continued to collaborate with us. I'm here today because of Dr. Bratton. We are here today because of Dr. Bratton's encouragement that a strong collaboration be identified and solidified with Chautauqua Institution and folks like you. The board is for, our board is formalizing the vision and mission statements that Dan articulated. One of Dan Bratton's legacies, and there are many, is the Robert Jackson Center. In my eyes, Dan Bratton, too, is a hero. I've described, go ahead, that's okay. I've described in very brief detail the mission of the Robert Jackson Center and hope we've passed on. Hopefully if you've received some uh, pamphlets, if you haven't, there's some around. We are a work in progress. If you said, let's go take a tour bus today to go to see what's going on at the Robert Jackson Center, I'd say don't wait till next year. That's how much this house, ha this has happened so rapidly. But do come next year. I'm now pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Professor John Q. Barrett. Associate, he's the professor of law at St. John's Law School. Just a few biographical notes on Professor Barrett. He graduated from Georgetown University, subsequently received his Juris Doctorate 
from Harvard. Thereafter, he was a law clerk to the Honorable A. Leon Higginbottom, United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit in Philadelphia. He was an associate counsel in the Office of Independent Counsel, Lawrence E. Walsh, where he participated in the criminal prosecution of Colonel Oliver North, Vice Admiral John Poindexter, Assistant Secretary of State Elliot Abrams, and former Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger. He worked in the Justice Department and then turned to the world of academia, and he's currently, as I mentioned, a professor of law at St. John's University. He thought he's authored several articles and essays, and is currently on sabbatical to undertake intensive study on Robert H. Jackson. Ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled to introduce a real scholar, John Q. Barrett. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you to the Chautauqua Women's Club, Meredith Rousseau, Jane Leahy, to the Jackson Center and Greg Peterson, also Drs. McVeigh and Bratton, and all of you for being here, for giving me this opportunity to give you a bit of an exposure to the life and career of this tremendous and tremendously important man. His life story in chronological terms has been outlined by Greg. So what I will do with uh, a portion of time here is tell you about six episodes in his career that I think illustrate things about his character and that nicely connect with the theme of this week, which is heroism. Uh, one of those episodes is his work as the chief American prosecutor at Nuremberg, but I am deliberately uh, stinting on my discussion of that because I will stop in time for your questions. I suspect many of them will relate to Nuremberg, and I welcome that discussion. Uh, I have done quite a few Jackson-related talks, and I find that the audience has much to add uh, to each of those discussions, and this is a very special audience. Before I begin the six episodes I want to talk about, I do want to remind you that he is a son of Chautauqua, not only in the geographic sense of Chautauqua County, but in the immediate sense of the Chautauqua Institution. Uh, after a fair amount of research, the first occasion on which Justice Jackson spoke here at the Chautauqua Institution was long before he was Justice Jackson. Uh, there was a winter session. Uh, one only imagines what the conditions were. But on Lincoln's birthday in 1908, uh, I'm sorry, there, there's an early occasion I do want to mention first. In 1908, uh, Jackson said in later writings that he was privileged to hear William Jennings Bryan speak here at Chautauqua. So he was, uh, like you and like me, a listener and a learner before he ever got to this side of the podium. In 1917, he gave the Lincoln's birthday speech when he was only uh, 24 years old. It was, in fact, the day before Jackson's own birthday. And he spoke about Lincoln and Washington on that occasion. Um, and the Chautauquan Daily contains a little mention that's a, a laudatory description of his great reputation as a lawyer, his great skill as an orator, and his perspective on great American character and leadership in the area of heroism, which is um, more than coincidental, I think. In 1929, Jackson has moved up in the world and is by then a very successful lawyer in Jamestown, a real pillar of his community, a leader of his profession, and very active in county and statewide democratic politics. He's part of the entourage that brings and hosts Governor Franklin D. Roosevelt when he speaks here in July of 1929. Um, ironically, on the subject of programs and initiatives that he is overseeing in the state of New York to advance the treatment, the care, and the useful social experience of what Roosevelt referred to as cripples. Um, now, given, of course, what we know of President Roosevelt's own condition, um, that must have been a particular poignant and powerful address. In 1936, Bob Jackson has risen even higher. By that point, he has gone to Washington. He served in the Treasury Department. He is now at the Department of Justice, and he is a Roosevelt insider. And on that occasion, he sits in the honored seats on the aisle immediately behind the podium on the occasion of President Roosevelt's famous I Hate War speech over in the amphitheater. A, a final Chautauqua Institution moment to flag here at the beginning is a speech that Jackson gives in 1947 after he returns from Nuremberg. He's invited here to be the 4th of July speaker and himself at the podium now in the amphitheater. He speaks to 7,000 people in those early days of the Cold War, in those days of great public fear about a third world war, us against the Soviet Union. Jackson had many things to say, but he delivered a message that 
in a way is a follow-on, a continuation of I Hate War. His message in 1947 was that war need not be inevitable, and in his view wasn't, that international cooperation provided a hope, and that his experience at Nuremberg was a direct experience with that kind of cooperation. Now, with that background, what I want to review is six moments. And let me list them and then categorize them for you, and then we'll discuss each of them briefly. The first one is 1913. Jackson is 20 years old. He is working as a lawyer. He's defending uh, criminally prosecuted labor union members and strikers in a railway incident in Jamestown. And uh, yeah, I think it's a defining event in his career. The second is in 1935, where he prosecutes civilly uh, Andrew Mellon, and Greg has already referred to that. The third is 1937, where as an assistant attorney general, he defends President Franklin Roosevelt's court packing plan very aggressively and, although not successfully, uh, in everyone's view, almost successfully. He almost saved what was at the, t at the time a sure loser. The fourth moment, 1943, is when Jackson is on the Supreme Court and involves the decision of the Korematsu case, which was about the internment of Japanese American citizens of the United States. The fifth moment, 1945-46, is his work as the chief American prosecutor before the, Amer the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. And the final category or incident is his work as a justice on the cases in the 1950s that focused the Constitution and the country on the question of race in America. In other words, those six incidents illustrate crime and community, government power, judging, war, peace, and race as a list of challenges and tests of character and, frankly, constituents of heroism. I don't think you could write a better list than that. And that's just a slice of this man. So episode number one, the street railway strike of Jamestown, New York, 1913. Street Railway was the name of the company that ran the trolleys in Jamestown. It was mass transit in the time. And in May of 1913, there was a divisive, bitter strike that paralyzed the city of Jamestown. At the time, Bob Jackson is an apprentice in the office of attorney Frank Mott, and he's not yet admitted to the bar because he's not yet 21 years old. There is rioting in the streets of Jamestown where the strikers, through various acts of sabotage, try to strengthen their hand in the paralysis that grips the city. And they do such things, not commendable, but if you think of old labor union dynamics, um, not our relatively civilized and rare kinds of labor union disputes, but uh, we're talking real class organizing and warfare. Um, they clip wires, they chop down poles, they pull up track, uh, et cetera, as part of stopping the railway line. Um, there are four nights of rioting that paralyze the city of Jamestown. The local papers show true violence and talk of bringing out the National Guard and so forth. And in the, the course of all this, many, many workers are arrested. Frank Mott is retained. Mott is an active local Democrat, and he's one of the, the mentors who leads Jackson into Democratic politics. Mott is retained to represent a group of the strikers. Mott almost immediately is appointed to be a member of the New York State Utility Commission, and thus has to relinquish these cases. Well, where do these guys go for legal representation? The kid's ready to step up. Bob Jackson, age 20, demonstrates no shortage of self-confidence in this early challenge, and through court permission, gets a special authorization to represent a group of more than a dozen strikers, the Mott clients subsequently abandoned by Mott. Uh, Jackson needs his adversary, the district attorney, to consent to this uh, succession of, of him, an unlicensed non-lawyer for Mott, a senior and capable lawyer. And as Jackson noted in a later memoir, uh, the district attorney gave his consent immediately, <laughs> which made me pause. <laughs> but it didn't make him pause very long. And what Jackson did was took one of the cases to trial, really one of the very early cases, and he won an acquittal in a hard-fought case. Now, the court records don't really survive, but we can imagine, given the rioting and the conduct that was at issue, there was no soft prosecuting going on here. And Jackson, whose career did not include a lot of criminal defense work as an attorney, was really in this first big at bat doing criminal defense work in a big stakes context. Immediately after his client, his lead client, is acquitted, the district attorney turns around and gets a grand jury to reindict the man on additional related charges. And 
Um, there was no double jeopardy clause applied to the states at this time, so Jackson beat him once, let's go again, was the district attorney's attitude. Jackson writes and files a motion that is unprecedented in that time, asking the judge to throw out the charges because they are based on the uncorroborated testimony of accomplices, something that much later becomes fairly standard and ultimately becomes a constitutional protection. And in a bitterly contested argument, the judge agrees with Jackson. The charges are dismissed. The subsequent defendants, all built on cases with the same kind of accomplice testimony, are dismissed. And in a sense, the end of the street railway episode is this legal brainstorm and advocacy by 20-year-old Bob Jackson. What does this episode show? Well, self-confidence plus talent, talent at the forensic level, talent at the analytical level, an exposure to and a willingness to step into disputes on the side of the underdog. And I flag that because it's something that Jackson continued to speak to and think about even later in life when he was most definitely, um, if it's a word, what we would call an overdog. He was the attorney general, the chief American prosecutor after the allied victory in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. Always remained very focused on proportion and balance and concern about piling on uh, when it's excessive to the actual justice of a situation. I think some of that is born in this 1913 episode. It also finally, to me, illustrates a talent for resolution and reconciliation. This was his town. This was a divisive physical event and legal event in his town. And by advocacy through an adversary process, he brings it to a resolution that in the end puts the cars back on the rails, the town goes forward, and it's part of what begins to build his climb to really the man to see in Jamestown and Chautauqua County and so forth. Uh, uh, an avid Democrat through his whole life in a very Republican county, as you perhaps know, um, and a man who moved from representing the railway strikers to representing every major corporation in his town, uh, where the clients who were hiring him were not people who shared his politics. What they, represe what they represented were people who saw his substance, and what they respected were the abilities plus the judgment plus the values, and that's part of the legal climb. The second episode, the prosecution of Andrew Mellon. Andrew Mellon was the Secretary of the Treasury, appointed by President Harding, retained by Pre President Coolidge, President Hoover. Hoover then sends him to England as the ambassador to the Court of St. James. And he, of course, was Mellon of the Mellon Fortune based in Pittsburgh. Mellon didn't do a great job on his taxes, or his people didn't do a great job on his taxes. And Jackson's first job in Washington is as general counsel of the Revenue Bureau, what today we call the IRS in the Department of the Treasury. What he found when he got there was part of the job involved supervising 200 lawyers. And in my view, demonstrating good judgment, he was no fan of bureaucracy or administration. What he wanted to do was law, and that meant cases, and that meant representation, and here was something big that needed somebody capable to handle it. What had happened before his arrival in Washington was an effort to criminally prosecute Mellon. That case was brought to a grand jury in Pittsburgh, which decided not to return an indictment. So it goes. The Roosevelt administration then decided to, pr to pursue civil remedies, in other words, collection actions plus penalties, based on a theory of fraud, because what Mellon had done was a series of sham sales that moved assets from one corporate shell to another freeing it uh, from his personal control, but in fact keeping it under his personal control, and by the fictitious of corporate ownership, trying to avoid personal income tax consequences. And we're talking about things like real estate and a large collection of art. Jackson handled this case in Pittsburgh, in the appellate tax court in Washington, D.C., um, over a two-year period, also managing his collateral responsibilities still as the chief counsel, and basically fought the case to a settlement. What was interesting about it is that in its time, it was the controversial prosecution in federal law enforcement. Hoover's Secretary of the Treasury, prosecuted by Roosevelt. You know, what, what better persecution or scapegoating or trumped up initiative could you imagine, said the Republicans. Well, Jackson, having gotten to the inside of it, um, had to deal with that kind of criticism. And so having gone from the underdog side to the overdog side, he's still catching a lot of fire in his work in the Mellon case. The case is ultimately resolved by a settlement after uh, a 75% victory by Jackson at the trial level, and of that, 
a 60% victory in the appellate court, and it involves a bunch of tax issues that I hope never to understand, and I certainly won't burden you with. Um, what's interesting is a joke that comes out of this, um, because you may know that the Mellon Art Collection today is the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. That donation was made by Mellon spontaneously, uh, directly to FDR, as this tax case was being resolved in 1937. And of course, you know, quid pro quo perished the thought, never should a, a serious tax matter be resolved by something like an art donation to the nation. But cutting through all that was the joke, um, the joke between FDR and Bob Jackson um, as they sat together on the dais at the ribbon cutting in 1941 that opened the, what's now the West Wing of the National Gallery of Art, um, there must have been a smile exchanged and private correspondence showed that for his lifetime FDR referred to that place as Bob's Museum. <laughs> so I guess the news for Greg is, uh, and all of you in Chautauqua County, is that the Jackson Center as it rises and flourishes uh, will be Bob's Museum Part 2. What does the Mellon case illustrate? To me, it shows an exposure to and success in the cauldron of controversy. It shows Robert Jackson assuming and handling and wielding aggressively the power of a prosecutor tempered by the restraint of one who values proportionality in addition to victory. Um, I think that connects it back and connects it forward to the other things. Episode three, the court packing fight. The backdrop, you may recall, is the Supreme Court decisions in 1934, 1935, and early 1936 invalidating various parts of the New Deal program, the National Recovery Act, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and so forth. The court of nine old men um, were standing in the way of the president and the overwhelming majority that he had in both houses of Congress and the legislative program that they had passed to deal with the Depression. FDR is re-elected overwhelmingly in 1936. I hate war is a campaign speech, you may recall. Uh, and in the end, um, as goes Maine, so goes Vermont. Landon gets two states, Roosevelt wins everything else. Flushed with victory, perhaps too flushed with victory, and filled with bad advice and not from Bob Jackson, FDR in February of 1937 unveils what we know as his court packing plan. How do you deal with nine old men? Well, if they won't go away, you dilute them. The statute Roosevelt proposed would have appointed a new justice for every justice over the age of 70 who did not retire during the next six months. Assuming no retirements, that would have enlarged the Supreme Court of nine to the Supreme Court of 15. And you can think what Roosevelt nominees would have voted and think that that would have changed the invalidation of the New Deal problem that FDR was dealing with. All fine and straightforward, and we know that in hindsight. There's a problem, though, in how FDR explains this plan, which was hatched by his attorney general, Homer Cummings, uh, and not Jackson and other underlings at the Department of Justice. FDR says this plan is only about two things. Perish the thought that this is about packing the court, getting more congenial votes on our side of these New Deal constitutional controversies. This is about the health of our most senior and cherished justices. We don't want those old gentlemen to have to work so hard and new blood to share the load will be a good thing. Plus, they've fallen so far behind in their work that this will simply help the administration of the court and deal with its backlog. That is literally FDR's statement, his pitch, his explanation. Um, and you know how to shovel stuff on the farms of Chautauqua County. I think you know how that went over with the American people. Jackson came to the fight late, after it was in trouble. And he testified in late March of 1937 to the truth of the plan. The truth of the plan is exactly as I've described, that the Supreme Court was standing in the way of the democratic will in the name of an overly restrictive reading of the Constitution. Now that's viewed by its critics and, and by everyone under the label as court packing. But the argument that Jackson makes, the argument that almost turns the debate, is an argument about judicial restraint because more judges on the Supreme Court, diluting these nine, will restrain the court. It will stop the court from getting in the way and invalidating the program that you, the people, have voted for, that they, the Congress, have enacted, that he, the President, has signed. Now that's a theory that looks better and better with every passing year, in my view. <laughs> that the court's place is not to decide the politics of the country. We don't remember that that's what Franklin Roosevelt stood for. 
in the court packing plan and that Bob Jackson, his aggressive young assistant and advocate, was actually arguing for. Um, they don't win. The plan is pulled in the summer of 37. Um, but deference to the political branches is a value that I think is ingrained in Jackson during this controversy and something that comes to be a key part of his later career. Episode four, Korematsu. Japanese Americans immediately after Pearl Harbor are a suspect population in our country. And it's hard to imagine what the time was and what the perspective was, but once bombs have fallen on American soil, even Pearl Harbor, um, I think a justifiable fear of the enemy and allies of the enemy within our borders makes perfect sense. The question is, are these people allies of the enemy or are these people citizens who should be evaluated on an individual basis? Um, you may remember the name General DeWitt. He was the, uh, the power, the man who issued the orders, the overseer of what first became a curfew for citizens of Japanese American descent on the West Coast and then became the internment. The first challenge that goes to the Supreme Court, and by 1943 Jackson is there, is to the curfew. And Jackson votes with the court to uphold the curfew in a case called Hirabayashi. He's reluctant, but he's persuaded by the government's arguments that a showing of military necessity can justify the limited measure of a curfew. A simple hours restriction in your homes. Uh, it was 8 p.m. in San Francisco for most of the time period we're talking about. Um, and the court approves that. And the government's promise as it's defending the curfew and winning the Hirabayashi case is, the question is defined narrowly. This has nothing to do with any further measures. This is a curfew case. Well, no sooner does the executive branch win the, the curfew, the Hirabayashi case, then DeWitt issues the internment orders. Japanese Americans are relocated, as you know. And one brave man, Fred Korematsu, declines to go and becomes the test case. And in the Korematsu case, as it makes it way to, its way to the Supreme Court, the government defends the relocation order by saying, this is just like the curfew. Okay, so so much for the promises of a narrow issue and no precedent and so forth. And at that point, Jackson draws the line. The Supreme Court in Korematsu, not its finest hour, upholds the internment by a vote of six to three. Three justices dissent, Owen Roberts, Frank Murphy, and Bob Jackson. They each write an opinion. And the argument among eight of the justices is about whether DeWitt and the executive branch had made a showing of military necessity and thus justified in constitutional terms this explicitly racially based relocation order that the internment program was. The only person who breaks away from that does the military have a good enough reason or not debate is Jackson. And what Jackson does in the case is talk about the Constitution and the place of the court. And to give you a sense of, I know you have the pamphlet and I commend it to you and everything else he ever wrote, but to give you a sense of his language, I'd like to read you a few lines from his dissent in Korematsu. His general argument here is that military necessity or not is not something the court will be, ever be competent to evaluate. And military power is something that the court will never be powerful enough to stop. So if the military really wants to do this, we nine people in the Supreme Court aren't going to stop them. The most that can stop them is the end of the war and the people of the country. It comes back again to the popular sovereignty issue we saw in court packing, stopping them through the political process. In the meantime, he says, we shouldn't debase the Constitution by blessing it in the name of the Constitution. He writes, once a judicial opinion rationalizes such an order to show that it conforms to the Constitution, or rather rationalizes the Constitution to show that the Constitution sanctions such an order, the court for all time has validated the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and of transplanting American citizens. The principle then lies about like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of urgent need. Every repetition embeds the principle more deeply in our law and thinking and expands it to new purposes. All who observe the work are familiar, of courts are familiar with what Justice Cardozo described as the tendency of a principle to expand itself to the limit of its logic. A military commander may overstep the bounds of constitutionality, writes Jackson, and it is an incident. But if we review and approve, that passing incident becomes the doctrine of the Constitution. On that basis, I dissent. The military may do this and can do this, but a court should have no part of it. 
Episode number five, Nuremberg. This is a story you know well, and I'll summarize briefly. The war is winding down in the spring of 1945 in Europe, and the question in many circles is what to do with the Nazi leaders upon Allied victory. At that time, the question really included Hitler, what to do with Hitler. There are three options that were in play and being debated. One was to capture and execute. This was supported to varying degrees by the big three. Stalin and Churchill, in fact, were enthusiastic about it. And FDR at Yalta didn't agree, disagree too much, although he sort of turned the conversation away from lining up and shooting X numbers of people. If that's the path the victors take with regard to the losers, then you get into the question of definition. Who do you line up and shoot? When that had been discussed, at Tehran, the conference before Yalta, Stalin had proposed to shoot 50,000 Germans. Okay? That's one option. And, y you know, it, it's no cliche to say war is hell, and there's no reason that the rightful killing uh, stops at any particular moment. The victor decides when to stop killing, even rightful killing in a war context. And this option really is a war option, in my view. The second idea that was in play at the time was to reduce Germany as a national entity. The proponent of this was Henry Morgenthau, the Secretary of the Treasury. He said, destroy its industrial base, leave it as a nation of agricultural peasants, and impose an allied occupation government. In other words, don't worry about a criminal process or executing people, just have them all living in horrible hovels. And, you know, I, I don't know if it would be true even up at the level of Hitler, but one day you're a great officer in the Third Reich, the next day you're starving on some little farm. And that's what the condition should be. That's what victory should be as it's imposed on the German people. The third proposal is some kind of war crime prosecution. There are planning efforts that are made in the various governments leading up to the end of the war, and there's a question about whether an individual nation or an international consortium should prosecute. The lesson of Versailles and World War I was accurate in everyone's mouth. There had been a brief and totally failing effort to do a prosecution following World War I. And Jackson, as a justice, is watching this debate and on his own, not really campaigning for anything, decides to enter it by delivering a very powerful speech in April 1945. Indeed, April 13th, the day after Roosevelt's death. What Jackson argues for, this is before the American so Society of International Law, is a real trial. He says, part of winning is the values of the victors. And the values of not just this country, but the alliance is law, is right, is proportional treatment of citizens and humans. And we should vindicate those principles through a true trial. Now, what's a true trial? A true, tr true trial is not something on the show trial mile, model where a verdict is predictable and a trial takes a couple of hours and you hear the guns cracking before the sunset. A real trial means a burden of proof on the prosecutor. A real trial means an independent judiciary. A real trial means defense counsel. A real trial means discovery that allows the defense counsel to do their jobs. And he outlines this in the speech, and only two weeks later he's asked by an emissary on behalf of President Truman to go and make it happen. What he does first is go to London, and in an amazing feat of diplomatic work over the summer of 1945, negotiates the structure that brings the four disparate legal systems together, Britain, France, Soviet Union, United States, and defines the code of crimes that will be used to evaluate and indict and prosecute. They then go to Berlin, indictments are returned, 22 principal Nazi leaders, Hermann Goering, Joachim von Ribbentrop, Rudolf Hess, uh, Admiral Karl Dönitz, uh, Julius Streicher, the, the disseminator of viciously anti-Semitic propaganda, etc., are the defendants. And the trial begins in November 1945. Jackson is there in a context that, frankly, in some ways must have reminded him of the Mellon case, right? A winner prosecuting a loser, a winner blaming a loser for all the the world's evils. Of course, now we weren't just talking about a collapsed economy and the rich and the poor. We were talking about the atrocities of World War II. And what Jackson has to work out, really, as the lead prosecutor among the four countries, is how to do that job. He made a decision that was hard at the time and, frankly, I think, cut down on the popular acclaim at the time. He decided, once the investigative phase had found that this kind of evidence existed, 
to prosecute the case on the basis of captured Nazi documents. Now that makes for a great record, which makes for great history. It does not make for good newsreel footage, and it does not make for exciting trial headlines in the next day's papers. But he refused to do a case that involved making deals with cooperators who would then tell stories about Goering knew this and Hess knew that, because the ruthlessly compulsive documentation that the Third Reich had left and the Allies had captured showed a paper trail that allowed the case to be tried on documents. Now what did he find and what did that prove? Well, that is the record of the Holocaust. That was something that was only dimly understood in May of 1945. The camps had been liberated and reports had made its way back, um, but it became much more profoundly understood over the course of this year where Jackson did this work. In the end, what's the proof that it was successful? There were acquittals. Three defendants were acquitted. That only happens in a real trial. Look at Soviet show trials or any place else where a police state does so show trials. You never hear not guilty at the end of one of those. You got not guilty at the end of these. And although Jackson thought the tribunal cut it a little too fine on a few defendants, in general, he was pleased with that. What this model created, as Greg has alluded to, is the model that's very much in play today. Not only the Rwanda and Yugoslavia tribunals, but the coming International Criminal Court, which will take effect by treaty in about three years when 60 nations around the world ratify it. So that's episode number five, Nuremberg. Episode six, very briefly, race. Race is, of course, the, the original sin of this nation. I hope you got to hear Dr. Ellis as I did this morning. Um, I thought his remarks, like his book, is excellent on this issue. Uh, but finally, as a matter of American constitutional law, the race question, the 14th Amendment and the question of race is being decided by the Supreme Court during the years where Jackson is back from Nuremberg, 1946, through his death in 1954. Jackson has a serious heart attack on M March 30th, 1953, when Brown versus Board of Education is a pending case. He directly leaves his hospital bed to be back on the bench, to be visibly part of the unanimous court on May 17, 1954, that strikes down school segregation in Brown versus Board of Education. And I've, I've heard from people who were there that when the justices stepped through the velvet drapes and the press corps, the lawyers, et cetera, saw Jackson, they knew what was happening. Not only that he was back and that Brown was being decided, but that Linda Brown had won this case. Now here's where it gets complicated. The historical records show that Robert Jackson was a latecomer in signing on to the Chief Justice Warren opinion that invalidated segregation as we know Brown versus Board of Education. What Jackson was anguishing about is the same thing he was anguishing about in the Korematsu case, doing it in the name of the Constitution. Does something that exists in half the country and yesterday was constitutional somehow persuasively become unconstitutional just because the nine of us say it? Do we throw the name of the Constitution around? And can we do that persuasively on the basis of historical evidence? This is what the 14th Amendment meant and needs to mean. Or do we need to say something more candid? For if this is something that the court is going to do, and this is internal correspondence and ultimately not something that he writes, um, I think because he understood the value of unanimity and because of his heart attack and his convalescence, do we, the court, admit that we're making a decision of political power here? We shouldn't do this often, and God help us, we don't want to be the next nine old men or middle-aged, graying every minute. But in the right spot, politically, we should do it. And if we're doing it, we should admit it. Now, critics have read some of that stuff and say, well, Jackson was soft on segregation. Jackson was late to desegregation and so forth. Um, in fact, that's sloppy history. What Jackson was was a man of great non-discrimination in his heart and great respect for the political process and great frustration at his country's slowness in addressing this issue. And I'll close by reading you a paragraph from an otherwise unimportant case. Um, where he took the trouble to write something that I think goes to this. This is throwing out the criminal convictions of two black teenagers who were accused of raping a white, white woman in the South in 1950. The court, in a one-line sentence, throws it out because the grand jury was all white and that's unconstitutional. And Jackson writes a separate opinion concurring and saying, let's not pretend this is about juries. Because having one black member on the grand jury or even one black member on the trial jury wouldn't fix what this case shows to be wrong. 
The only chance, now I'm reading from Jackson's opinion, Shepard versus Florida, 1951. The only chance these Negroes had of acquittal would have been in the courage and decency of some sturdy and forthright white person of sufficient standing to face and live down the odium among his white neighbors that such a vote, a vote to acquit, if required, would have brought. To me, the technical question of discrimination in jury selection has only theoretical importance. The case presents one of the best examples of one of the worst menaces to American justice. It is on that ground that I would reverse. That too exemplifies a piece of his character. He spoke it true and he spoke it plain and he did it eloquently and that I think too is part of what makes him heroic. Thank you. We would welcome questions or comments. We need a brave soul to start it off. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm up here because I don't want to let you down. I have a question about the Nuremberg uh, Good, trial. Good, thank you. Uh, w would you speak to the apparent lack of enthusiasm uh, in subsequent years for the process that Jackson started? Well, it depends who you're talking about. I think you're talking about the United States. I, I'm not sure who I'm talking about. I'd just like you to talk the, about the, what the, seemed to have been the well, lack not an of, abrupt end to the process. Right, the lack of ending. enthusiasm, I think, in part reflects the Cold War as opposed to hot wars that define the next 40 years. So there weren't conflicts and government official behaviors like the Nazi behavior, uh, at least among the so-called developed nations on large scales, um, putting Vietnam to one side. Um, the American lack of interest, support, and enthusiasm I think is part about Vietnam and is partly about an argument that has become increasingly potent and I think is frivolous in our time. The specter of the captured American soldier being prosecuted by some crazed international consortium uh, for violating some claimed international norm. Um, I, the internet, it's a long complicated allegation and answer but the, the very short answer is that the Nuremberg Tribunal, the successors, and the treaty that will create the International Criminal Court define an area of moral, political, and diplomatic consensus. And the prospects of a captured American airman involved in a humanitarian or even non-humanitarian military activity becoming Hermann Goering um, is a fanciful scenario, um, in part because we're so powerful. Uh, sir? Excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> I'd like uh, to ask a question. Trying not to be political at all, um, is the recent um, Supreme Court involvement in the Florida law uh, vote counting, was that in too far an extension of the Supreme Court as you implied on other conditions? Trying not to be political, right? <laughs> um, one of the things I, uh, thank you for the question. I'm, I'm always careful not to claim to speak for Robert Jackson. Uh, I would give anything to get one cup of coffee with him, but obviously I never got to meet him. Um, but I think his view is, is one that, that I have come to, to value quite, quite a lot, which is that the court's place really is within the contours of things that the Constitution quite explicitly allocates to the court, defining provisions in the Bill of Rights, including the Equal Protection Clause as part of their job. But the matter of selecting electors and certifying a vote of the electors that defines a president is very specifically allocated to the Congress. And I think, um, I think it did the court no good um, and only saved the country a couple of weeks. And we're a resilient country. Whatever would have happened had the court not did, done what it did, um, we would be here today, right? I mean, the, the, the roof would not have fallen and we would have survived. We'd just be talking about a different denouement 
rather than Bush versus Gore. Um, so I think the court, as, as Jackson wrote in Korematsu, the court spends itself when it does things in the name of the Constitution. And so I think it should be careful that the Constitution really is asking it to do that job. I have a question about the Nuremberg trials. The question is, what exactly was the legal basis for having the trial at all? And in your commentaries, you mentioned that Jackson had said before, the military can do something, but we shouldn't give it a legal uh, connotation. Right. Is that exactly what he did, though, no, in the Nuremberg I, trials? I, I don't well, think well, so. What was the legal basis of the trial? The legal basis was formally the charter that they adopted in the summer of 1945. They, now that they made up a charter and then they That charter it? did not exist at the time of the conduct for which the Nazis were prosecuted. And one leading criticism of Nuremberg as, as a prosecution is the so-called ex post facto argument. Um, Senator Robert Taft made this argument in the 1950s. It's one of the incidents that se then Senator John F. Kennedy selected as a profile in courage, Taft criticizing Nuremberg. So this is a, a popular, respectable, complicated argument. Um, the answer, Jackson's answer, and I think a satisfactory answer, is that there's some truth to it, but some people at some time needs to start. And if what they're drawing on to start is not made up out of whole cloth, but in fact draws on things that simply weren't codified, but were in fact shared among legal systems and peoples, then you aren't ex post facto calling what was legal at the time you did it a crime. What Jackson was very careful to do as part of, I mean, the, the amount of work, the immense learning that was involved in this Nuremberg year uh, boggles the mind. He was very careful to get good input and advice on the pre-existing German legal system and Nazi law. And it led to his comfort level and answers this question to point out that under pre-Hitler and under Hitler legal codes, many of the specific acts, the conduct that was the basis of the prosecution was illegal. So that, that's how he worked through that question. Obviously, having established that precedent, at least civilization is now on notice since 1945 that war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, waging aggressive war, uh, conspiring to commit those ends are shared values, criminal events, uh, and that's embodied in UN declarations. Yes, I'd like to ask you about the process. Um, at this point, the Den Haag has been also asking for people from uh, Croatia to be sent and to be, um, these are indicted individuals that Croatia has not sent and they, they are military leaders. And if you could enlighten us what the process is in that. And secondly, if you have time to also go into Rwanda, what are the problems with that particular situation there starting the process and then it's really not been completed in those tribunals and what that means for civil rights and for human rights universally. Okay, Th these are good questions. One of the things I've, I've found is that immersing myself and mastering 1892 through 1954, the life of Robert Jackson, uh, is, is more than enough on my plate at the moment. And although I'm a, an interested reader, I am by no means an expert or uh, a comparable student of the Rwanda Tribunal, the Yugoslavia Tribunal. Um, but uh, so with that caveat, my general answer as to Yugoslavia is that they are um, a relatively well-functioning process, but still having problems uh, obtaining custody of indicted people, and Croatians are part of it. There's also a bit of a disturbing appearance that they're trying to demographically balance indictments so that as Serbs are indicted, Croats are indicted, and as Serbs are taken into custody, Croats are taken, and so on. And um, that kind of concern, uh, in my view, is not a proper prosecutorial concern. That's, that's politics, and it should be separated. The Rwanda tribunal is, is, is having a much harder time. Um, the very short description is that it is uh, very slow to get off the ground. It has an immense number of people in custody in horrible conditions. Many of the worst perpetrators still occupy positions of power as opposed to positions of investigation or indictment. Um, and I, I think it's, it sadly may reflect the different attention that what we used to call NATO or the Western world uh, pays to Africa as opposed to the, the European continent. <coughs>
Don't teach evidence. <laughs> I had a, uh, a Nuremberg question. Uh, with the codification of the law and uh, the set of crimes that were made to put against the German leaders, how did Justice Jackson feel about the fact that the Soviet government was guilty of quite a few of these uh, aggressive acts before they were invaded by the Nazis themselves? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, the, the short answer, and it's a wonderful piece of the research that I've been doing and the things I've been finding about Jackson at Nuremberg, is that he really, um, from the get-go, had a very hard time with the Soviet participation, and over the course of the year grew, I think it's fair to say, disgusted um, with the Soviet participation, both because of the sort of robotic um, referring back to Moscow and lack of independent discretion and decision-making power and the uh, entirely fraudulent efforts that they were making in the name of the tribunal to pin things on the Nazis that they themselves had done. The, the Katyn Forest Massacre in Poland is the leading example of that, but there were others. The way they divided up the case flowed from Jackson's discomfort with the, the Russian part or Soviet participation. Um, and in a sense, Jackson went first, and the conspiracy among the Nazi government to wage aggressive war, plus war crimes and crimes against humanity in the zones of American occupation were the parts of the case that the Americans were responsible for putting on. And then the British for zones that they controlled, and the French, although it was a bit of a, a, a fig leaf, um, for the, the zones that they allegedly controlled, and then the Soviets for the zones that they controlled. And Jackson physically absented himself from most of the Soviet section of the case. And I think that speaks volumes. Thanks. Okay, uh, did Judge Jackson ever respond anyway to what you read as alleged pressure, both politically and military, to, quote, go easy on some Nazis for uh, future relations, post-war relations with Germany and also the use of some of their knowledge? Yeah, I, th that is a complicated issue that I, I've been waiting to find things that speak to that. I have yet to find a document that shows anybody making an effort to steer Jackson or his investigative effort away from somebody because they had useful potential as a cooperator. Um, Jackson was there so early that I think his investigative phase, the indictment by October 1945 of the 22 defendants, the trial beginning November of the 21, one committed suicide, um, and the trial that ended in July, may have preceded a lot of, of that activity. There were subsequent trials that were conducted by Americans only, and I think that issue probably became more pronounced in later 46, 1947, 1948. Thank you, Thank you very much.